add to that the climate um, emergency and the challenges uh, we face. And I, I would also just throw up something I wrote yesterday, which is one of the perversities of climate change in, in that it's the poorest and the most marginalised who get hit first and hardest, but they're also most vulnerable to being negatively impacted by the economic restructuring we have to go through to decarbonise the economy. With more than 700,000 inhabitants in its metro area, Bristol has a particularly high proportion of neighbourhoods that are at risk with the energy crisis. These at-risk neighbourhoods are home for a higher proportion of kids, but they also ingrain complexities such as a high, diverse rate of ethnicities and cultural realities. And I suppose, thinking back to our, how we started, you know, we, we have always worked in the community where people are. We've co-designed and co-built this this centre. It's made of straw because we wanted to listen to people's aspirations around environment. Um, I think when we think about this project and we think about what what have we learned and um, what's the impact going to be and what would we do differently, I think it's 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 just a continuation of all of all of that practice and that that kind of way that we've grown. What's your thoughts about that? So the Bristol pilot, there was a deep focus on equality, diversity and inclusion principles that we brought into, you know, when we engaged the participants in this project. And also because it was a small pilot, it really taught us that investment in people and getting them on board with the tech, how important that is. And we were able to achieve that. Before I joined Twinergy, I was aware of uh, my energy uses, obviously I think everybody is, so I was keeping an eye on it and I had smart meters and stuff, but that's pretty much all you could do if you don't have anything else like the solar panels or anything. The sun comes up here, which is the east, goes down there, so I pretty much have it on the panels all day long, even mm -hmm. in the winter. And then in the shed, I've got a 11.6 kilowatt battery, which is massive. The massive battery, yeah? Yeah, 11.6 okay. kilowatts, which for one person is actually pretty much enough electricity for what I need during the day. Twin Energy were in collaboration with Noel West Media Centre. Um, and I believe the original grant was through Bristol City Council. And there was two guys, Sam and Matt, who were really involved. I mean, they were the ones I got an iPad with the, the system as well, so I could monitor on this app. But they also showed me how to use that. Any questions I had, I could go to them. We've really focused on trying to upskill the participants and bring them along on a journey, starting with very low level foundational understanding of energy that's often missing in a lot of people, like general members of the public, and trying to build up their understanding as we've gone through the project so that they're feeling much more comfortable and empowered in the way that they understand and interact with electricity. So how is it working right now for you? Yeah, it's working amazingly. I mean, I'm with a certain energy company where I get feedback from the battery at a certain time of day when it's at the highest rate. And at the moment, I'm currently in quite a lot of credit. So it means going forward into the winter months that I actually last year did not pay anything personally towards my bills. The solar panels actually paid for not only my electric, but my gas usage as well. Which was the situation uh, regarding energy before you joined Twinity? Uh, we didn't really understand uh, about the energy. We got a bill through, we paid the bill uh, and just used the energy as and when we wanted to. But there was no control over there was no like control bills over it. and the way you were spending? No, the direct debit, pay it. <laughs> just go to the top of the steps. Uh -huh. And just look, you can see everything that's up there. Good. That's the inverter in front of you. Uh-huh. And that's the batteries to your left. See right now, no? What one battery it's half of its capacity? Can it be? I think it's five kilowatts per battery. Uh-huh. So throughout the project, uh, it was really significant to see the progression of our participants and where they started, you know, with basic energy concepts and 
where they, in the end, were able to negotiate tariffs with energy companies and um, bills, essentially. So it was, it was really inspiring. And, you know, just to see them grow through this whole process and, you know, for them to also be able to challenge us. I mean, it's got like your home solar, battery and grid. And if you go down here to the re real time power graph, you can actually see from these arrows at the moment, the solar is going into the battery. Mm -hmm. Also feed in the house, but it's also going into the grid because the, the grid. batteries are 100%. Uh -huh. It's not impossible that some of those homes could have net zero bills over the course of a year in future if they can maximise the savings from both the solar generation and exploiting the smart tariffs and Twinages help them to get an insight about how they might do that in the future. I was with them before, they had a different tariff, which was still really good, I managed really well. But this summer I swapped the optical flux, mm -hmm. so it downloads from my battery into the grid, which is the between four and seven o'clock. Which is the peak. Which is the peak, peak amount of yeah. time that you get the most money for the electric you're giving back to the company. With the energy that we've earned, uh -huh. we don't pay anything, they pay us. Ovo didn't pay us any money for, for our uh, export because they said they didn't, they couldn't set it up or anything. But when we went to Octopus, right from the very beginning, just for four days, they gave us eight pounds something into our account, and then they paid 140 pounds into our account. It's, it's all silly stuff like that. Yeah, I think it being greener is something that I was always very interested in and keen on being, but it's also not very accessible for a lot of people because you have to have a lot of money to be able to afford to make greener choices. When I had use, full use of the battery and the solar, my electric bills, my tariffs, they changed dramatically. So um, suddenly I was using uh, far less energy from the grid. Therefore, my electricity usage and bills came right down. When the battery failed working earlier this year, then my habits had to change because I was using, I was just benefiting when the sun was shining. So therefore, I would, I changed my habits to try and use more power when the sun was out and when I was making power. And how important do you think is sharing? Sharing from what we've learned, uh, people really, really valued the sharing of their own experience, the sharing with others, the hearing, you know, other people's points of view. We found that was a really, really important thing for people in this project. For me, one of the big learnings is that there's still lots of barriers to participating in energy trading networks and things like that. Just taking on time of use tariffs, they favour those people who are more flexible with their lives and invariably that's people who don't have young children and people who don't necessarily work and I think that's one of the big learnings from, from the experience. Do you remember how we started? We wanted to place citizens at the heart of the energy market. We wanted to help them making informed decisions that have a positive impact on climate change and on energy poverty. And I feel like this time we are almost there. <laughs>